Again, where are we taking you tonight? Well, join us and wait and see what a night we're going to have. Hopefully, you're going to come with us too. We're heading to a dark place, literally the darkest place in Britain. Now, if you want to look that up on Google, that will tell you where we're heading. Hope you're going to come to on Britain's most listened to. It's the Night Owls taking a couple of listeners to the darkest of places. We warn you that this is Full Frontal Radio and may shock on occasion. We are proud to present the biggest show of its kind. This is Up Front. This is real life. This is Night Owls with Alan Robson. The people's voice. The people's voice. Get to those phones and get heard on Britain's most listened to talk show. With Alan Robson. Champion of the North. So what do you want to talk about? Start talking. Have you ever heard a greater silence than this? There's nothing there. Nothing in the air. Just a red and yellow flag directly behind me, three stories up, in a castle in the darkest part of Great Britain. Why is it so dark? Well, the observatories are here. And I'm just seeing some creature scuttling around at the bottom of a, a great castle door directly ahead of me. The way that it's bouncing looks like it's a small bird. Wouldn't surprise me to see a rat making the same journey. And we're here in an ancient place. There's just a slight hint of rain, and to be honest, I'm actually quite glad of it. It's so, been so warm across the evening. But now, there's that bird. But now it's getting black. And it's fair to say that before established religion, the peoples of Great Britain pretty much got along. There was the odd tribal conflict. Occasionally one tribe would join up with another one to become a bigger tribe. But in essence, a relatively peaceful 450,000 years. Now, here, on the land where Kielder stands, there have been settlements for over 300,000 years. This can be proven by bodies found, cave art going back to 7,500 BC. Tools, structures, cairns. We know that the majority of these tribal groups lived in peace because over 90% of them died of old age or disease. After religion arrived, the majority of bodies you find have been attacked, their skulls shattered with a sword, an axe, or a club. Well, if you go back to 130 AD, the Great Wall of Hadrian was being built. The tribes, very, very grateful to the Romans. I know a lot of people would think, oh, they'll be fighting them. No, they were very grateful to the Romans because their only enemies, the Picts from Scotland, they're building a big wall. We're not going to have to worry about all them Picts coming over here, doing bad things to us. The Romans were very clever in how they dealt with the sizable Northumbrian tribes, like the Votadini and their neighbouring tribes, the Brigantes. Instead of demanding that these tribes follow Roman gods, instead they were told that they were not even under Roman rule. They were told that they were a, fra a friendly client kingdom, they called them, living amongst the Romans. The tribal laws that they had would be followed, and these peaceful folk would act as a buffer against the more warlike Scots. How about that? Big tribe comes waving weaponry at you, and you say, we'll just be a client of yours. In other words, you haven't conquered us, but we'll pretty much do what you say. This is the area where we're in, where the real King Arthur, the tribal chieftain known as the Half-Roman, but he'd be slightly nearer the western coast. And peace remained until Christianity arrived. Ooh. 
getting the odd noise yeah that's that's a good start king edwin a pagan was converted and began carrying out an extensive program of conversion and baptism sounds lovely on paper but it meant murdering anybody who didn't want to become a christian these gentle people had survived and lived well for hundreds of thousands of years so the question would be why would you want to change to this other faith that was soaked in the blood of the innocent well edwin declared i was told by god to help the people there's a door just opened and literally closed directly behind me how amazing is that we're we're going to be blessed tonight i think so anyway he was told by it always worries me when somebody says i was told by god because you know in civilized parlance if somebody came up to you and said i've just had a conversation with god they would get a room with a straight jacket but anyway penfrith who was a pagan scribe wrote edwin guided thousands to their deaths the living becoming sheep who would obey every order you always knew where king edwin could be found you could follow him by the trail of the dead edwin made northumberland and far wider the leading spiritual power in britain on the settlements here around kielder they gave a respectful no to the offer to be baptized so king edwin declared that they were heretics heretics against god and ordered his soldiers to wipe them out these people were for or against nobody they just wanted to be left alone even a superpower like rome could see they were gentle and not a threat but the Christians had to kill every single one. It's believed over 43,000 men, women and children were killed belonging to the Brigantes and possibly up to 62,000 voted Dini. It was written, again by Penfrith, in the dark valley thought to currently lead to Kielder Reservoir. You could not walk nor ride for the depth of the corpses stood over a man's height. The insects, birds and beasts fed relentlessly on our brothers and sisters. I saw a wolf carry off a baby as it cried. The creature stopped, ripped open its throat for it to cry no more. Other villages were aflame, with soldiers stopping anyone escape the fire. Families joined hands in the heat and allowed the smoke to take their lives. These Christians, declaring their loathing for heretics, would still rape pagan women and rape their children too, before hacking them to pieces. Not far from here, near Kielder Castle, there's a pit where 17,000 Votadini were buried after Edwin's men had enjoyed what they described as sport with them. Now these tribesmen were big and strong, but their faith was against war and fighting. They believed it to be wrong. So on meeting these Christians, they were literally played with, mountain-sized men beaten, prodded with spears and swords to try and force them to fight, and yet most never did. And they were finished off. The more attractive women were given to Edwin and his retinue, others to his captains. All the rest were given to his men. And after they were finished, they were exterminated. For hundreds of years after this, some said that eerie figures rose from the ground to haunt the land, giving us some of Northumberland's earliest sightings. You're with Alan Robson. The Night Owls, and tonight, from Kielder Castle. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Now here we are at Kielder Castle with Yvonne Riley, who is the woman that's had it happen to her. It's all happened to her, apparently. You've seen, you've felt, you've had all kinds of stuff going on here. Yes, I've had lots of weird experiences in the castle. Like what, though? Um, I've heard voices, I've seen shadows, um, just felt presences around. What's the most vivid thing that's happened to you, the one that gave you the biggest fright then? Um, I moved into this part of the building a year ago. I used to have the cafe in the other part and mm. I came in in the first week I was open at about seven o'clock at night to put shopping away. And I was going out of the storeroom into the kitchen and I just heard this really loud 
sort of howling noise. And I thought somebody had crept in and they were trying to give us the spooks and there was nobody there. So I legged it. It was the spooks giving you the spooks. It was. I legged it. <laughs> I literally left every light on, every door open apart from the front door, and I went home in tears. Wow. I was shaken up. Now, the next day, you've got to come in and say, all that frozen stuff's going to be no good now because it's scattered across the kitchen floor. Oh, the freezers were closed. It was, um, <laughs> it was just the rest of the stuff. But oh. I was really nervous the next day when I came in. I and I'm not so bothered. I'll come in in the morning, 6, 7 o'clock on my own, but I'll never lock up on my own. I always make sure my husband or a member of staff's here with us if it's dark. Are you the only person that's seen stuff or have other people seen and heard stuff as well? The odd member of staff has sort of said, I'm sure I saw a shadow go down the corridor and my daughter who works for us um, has said, you know, she's caught something out the corner of her eye yeah. and the storeroom in particular, we hear voices in there. But I only found out um, this year that this was all the staff's quarters when the castle was built in 1775 for the Duke of Northumberland for his hunting lodge. Right. Um, so obviously it's the staff, the ghosts of the staff prowling about. Yeah, and not wanting you prowling about. Probably not. No, maybe don't <laughs> like me cooking. But si since I've moved into this area, I got a print out of the castle and um, I found out that the next level up where the exhibition is, that that was the Duke of Northumberland's area. Wow. And there was a, r a room in there that I used to find a little bit spooky. I don't know what it was about the room. It wasn't dark, but I, I didn't like being in that room. And then when we've had like the ghost people come into the castle to do these ghost nights, mm. they said that was the room that they picked up all the activity. And then I got this print out about what the room was used for, and it turned out it was actually the Duke of Northumberland's bedroom. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yeah. And they said he doesn't like women. He was married though, wasn't he? He was, but... To a woman? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Hope so. That was Charlotte, I think, was, was the name of the other lady. Um, but you just didn't like other women, didn't like didn't, the whole woman like, thing. You know, this, this is what that ghost group told us anyway. But, mm. uh, you know, it, it was, it's just one of those rooms and the exhibition that just used to freak us out when I went in. I just felt just there was something, yeah, there was something in there. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. You're very welcome. So we're getting ready to get into Kielder Castle for the very first time. Now, in prehistory, a pile of bodies was heaped up here, a cairn of stones built over the top of them, and it was supposedly called the Devil's Lapful. Maybe a tad fanciful, probably made up, but to this day, nobody knows how these seemingly healthy people all died. About 30 men and women, without disease or sword wound, all dead. Their bodies wrapped around each other. Was it some bizarre suicide ritual? There was no sign of burning or assault, yet there they lay. What else happened here? Well, on this very ground, this is where, centuries later, William Wallace tore through the area, stealing what they could and killing any man who stood against them. Fact was, throughout Northumberland, there were more men supporting him than denying him. And this place, Kielder Castle, in 1775, a hunting lodge was built, a castle, so that the Duke of Northumberland could bring his royal and aristocratic friends to an absolute paradise of wildlife. To any historian who checks, there were very few events that could lead to any serious ghostly activity. Yet Sir Henry Percy's wife, Charlotte, who waited for him and bought him out of the Scots' hands when he'd been captured, she regularly roams around here. You'll feel her touching your arm or your back or stroking your hair, kissing your cheek. She walks in and out of Marie, the maid's room, and you often hear swishing and giggling between them. Now, Marie was said to have fallen pregnant to a young footman, and Sir Henry had a law, he had a rule, that any staff that fell pregnant, their jobs would be terminated. Problem is, his wife Charlotte and Marie began conspiring to camouflage her bump and to let her have the baby and then send it away, as many children born on the wrong side of the sheets were back in those days, to be raised by nuns or sold into service when at a decent age. However, to their horror, Marie's child was still born, and now they had to hide a body. Now this child was never seen. 
and Marie continued her close alliance to Lady Charlotte. There's dozens of stories detailing what happened to the baby. Was she walled up, hurled off the castle walls so nature would drag it away and feed from it? Yet the hall has a baby ghost, a ball that floats around the castle like a fiery orb. You often hear the baby crying, and some say that Charlotte asked Marie to build up a huge fire in the fireplace, then send her to bed. The child was put onto the fire, and more logs kept being added until the poor tiny soul was totally and utterly consumed. Using the poker, any bones existing like the skull and rib cage were beaten and smashed beyond recognition, so poor Marie would not recognise what she'd be cleaning away the following morning. Oh, there's a breeze, a nice cold breeze just went up my spine there. As soon as I mentioned that baby spirit, there's a strong wind around this courtyard. That tiny spirit has been seen around the castle. There is a little proof of another serving wench in the late 1700s hurling herself to her death down a well. Her lover had run off with a married woman, leaving her humiliated and pregnant. Her broken body was removed from the well and buried on a hillside next to her family's cottage in Burness. Yet the darkened force that seems to search around this castle, it seems to search around the castle looking for people, may well belong to that tormented soul of Edward Ball, the senior groundsman who lived in an attic room so that he could overlook the gardens that he was responsible for. He had a team of staff keeping the flower beds immaculate, the trees trimmed, the lake free from algae. Yet no one liked him. He always had an eye for the ladies, but the women at the castle all found him creepy, bad breath, sweaty, an all-round unpleasant individual. He regularly assaulted the young boys who cleaned out the stables and acted as grooms. Several gardeners quit their jobs rather than work for him. Things came to a head when he whipped three young boys for laughing one afternoon. One was so badly cut he needed 31 stitches just to hold his body back together. That night in his bed in the room that is attic too, he was smothered to death with a pillow. Some say as many as 11 men and boys went up there to finish him. Yet the local surgeon put it down to pneumonia as he'd been coughing for nearly a month. So this group of people got away with murder. Yet his wicked soul leaps out and terrifies people. Some push downstairs, some physically hit. There's a few entities that seem to have made their homes here. One, a smuggler called Brewery Jack, who ran his own get-rich scheme, running illicit booze from way over the coast near Bambra to all of the castles inland. He was making good money travelling what he called the Smuggler's Leap, a 35-mile track through dense forest on his cart. He was eventually captured red-handed and hanged outside the castle on a tree along with his five associates. It was almost Christmas. Folk talked of how the castle didn't dress a Christmas tree. Instead, it let people hang instead. And there's been a shooting incident. In the early 1800s, Anthony Green was shooting at a stag using a flintlock rifle that exploded in his face, shattering his skull and killing him instantly. Some say they have seen the bloody sight of half a face peering out of the sheer darkness here in the castle. And will we be seeing that tonight? Now, the one thing we've done this time that we've never done before We've put a microphone in the car where Tony Antoine de Bouille, our producer, is driving our two victims towards the castle right now. Let's see how they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take it on, just on the right hand. The most haunted is a pain shade. Oh, we all know that. What's his name? Is that Derek? Oh, Derek Akora. <laughs> Derek. What a wonderful man. <laughs> Fabulous. Just, no, just, just, does ghosty stuff actually happen? It was all. Well, I really never shoot. really believed until I went on my first one. Ah, oh, don't tell me that. So, <laughs> and I saw like a shadow, and, I, and then I saw because we put this sugar in a like a clear box yeah. and we all signed it and sealed it. Oh. And then went whoever was doing the ghost hunt went and hid it somewhere, so we didn't know where it was. Yeah. And when we went back to get it, 
so nothing had moved but an M just appeared in it as if someone was drawing it oh my god hand. and the girl that we took who was um, latched onto the little girl ghost yeah. was called Mandy and, and M just appeared and we're all watching it as well and it was just the freakiest thing I've ever seen and there was no way anyone could have sort of oh messed with it or anything like yeah. that so it was quite amazing but it wasn't scary that's the thing because yeah. it was it just quite amazing oh I'm excited <laughs> I love road trips <laughs> <laughs> I'll be hanging out the window like a dog. <laughs> I'm standing next to here with somebody that we should have expected a Scot so close to the borders. Alex McLennan, who has a title far too long for any door that I know. What's your title then? Recreation and Public Affairs Manager for the North East of England. My goodness, that's two doors with. Comfortably two doors. Thank you so much for inviting us here today and uh, the castle's got an amazing history. We're delighted to have you along. It's, it, it's steeped in history and um, the story about Kielder Castle has never probably been fully told over the years. Um, the amazing thing about this building is it's never ever been fully, fully utilised since the day it was built. Isn't that in unbelievable? Especially, first of all, it's in a garden paradise, isn't it? It's amazing. Um, who knew when Kielder Castle was built in 1775? In them days, um, you're looking at open Northumberland, pasture land, and it really was a, a hunting lodge for the Ju Duke of Northumberland. They would come here uh, in the summer, and, and my kind of humorous take on it is they came here, had a great party, um, they went and shot things, and uh, the women folk did what the women folk did, and uh, knitted on the lawns and had a great time in the sunshine, and, th and then they just uh, locked it all up again and went home, and, and it took about 12 hours. But what's really fascinating is who knew um, when it was built how one day it would end up in the largest forest in Northern Europe, it was man-made. And the darkest, one of the darkest places in the country. And we're hearing that there's, even more recently during world wars, people would come here to recuperate from war wounds and stuff. So, I mean, it, it, modern history too. I mean, absolutely, uh, that's right, fascinating. The fact that uh, there was a whole encampment for people from the Navy to recover, Kielder Castle played that part. Um, it was actually the headquarters of the Forest Commission at one point in north of England. It was a pub believe it or not, and it was a dance hall for locals. <laughs> and so, it, 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 what a history. And, um, you know, um, there's stories that uh, I know of foresters who are now near the retirement age telling me how they bumped their gorgeous Mark II escort off the edge of the building coming to the dances, it's, you know, in the 1970s. So it's, it's, you're absolutely right, Alan, it's got this great history and it means a lot to local people in North Tyne Valley. No, absolutely. When I start looking at any place, the first thing I do is I go back to pagan history, which is like pre-BC and even then the stories attached to exactly this this area of land we know it goes back because there's been relics found in cave paintings 300,000 years so blame me this is it's been here a long time and to me as a not proud northerner why didn't I know it was here why haven't I been here before because I, I mean, we do castles. We, you know, we visit castles. But, but why the hell have we never been to Keele? And I'm so glad that I've come. So glad that I know it's here. And you're surrounded by little mini villages, and you've got all the amenities. That's the beauty of Keele Water Forest Park. And delight, we really are delighted you're along today, Alan. That um, Keele Water Forest Park is quite. Um, it's it's sort of well known in North East of England, but a lot of our visitors come from far and wide across the UK and from foreign lands. Mm. But actually, how many people in Newcastle? And to think of going to Keel the Water Forest Park for a day out. And, uh, you know, it is a huge attraction, and you're absolutely right, the, the castle, the castle probably gets about 10% of the visitors, so about 37,000, 38,000 people per year come in. And interestingly, one of the questions staff do get is, well, I wonder, wonder what the history of the building was. And when we, when we look out here in the courtyard, you can see that only one and a half floors are actually utilised, and of course the, the great intrigue and interest is there's all these empty rooms and, uh, you know... What were they for and all the rest of it? Well, we've been looking, and we've, on some of your maps, it actually tells you loosely what some of these things are for. We're going to be uh, giving you as full a history as we've been able to find out in the relatively short space of time that we've had to, to, uh, to prep for it. Uh, with respect, I just think that there's uh, people from our part of the world, now my patches, middle Scotland down to the North Riding of Yorkshire, that's, that's the patch that we cover, they would come, the vast majority have rang me and they've said, Ah, oh, went to Keeler as well, had that most lovely day. It's two minutes 
from the reservoir and they could have been here too we've got to make sure that everybody knows that this place is worth coming to see and has great stories i think the ghostly bits that just adds an extra little bit of oh i wonder if i'm there whether i'll get that uh, walking up my spine but uh, bottom line it's just worth coming to see absolutely the modern day visit attraction of kielder castle here in the heart of the forest is um it's about tourism all year round you know and um, we've got the dark skies we've got this fantastic observatory and the the, the Dark Sky Park has been a phenomenal thing. We got the award um, coming up a year ago soon to be the darkest sky in Europe and the largest land mass of, you know, joined up thinking between the National Park, the Forestry Commission, the Council, um, the Kielder Water Forest Park Development Trust, everybody working together. And, and sometimes people think about dark skies as about switching lights off. We, we, we never wanted to ask people to switch lights off. It's about thinking about light use and maybe turning the light to face down. And um, what, what some tremendous stories are, people have came out here to Kielder and experienced the dark sky. And I live just at Bellingham down below mm. Kielder, but I can assure you I've been here to many events at Kielder Observatory and sometimes, let's be honest, you do get it cloudy. So it's only one in sort of five, it's going to be a really tremendous starry night. But even myself personally, driving down that road at midnight, pulling in and going, mm. wow. wow. And I live here. You, get a, it's, you feel that the stars and the planets are in your pocket here. Yeah. And to see a moon, especially when you get that big kind of midsummer moon, it's duh, you can touch it, can you? That's right. We've had stories of people actually being a little bit inundated by how dark it is and peaceful. <laughs> As people say, well, actually, I'm kind of not used to the bus not trundling past my front door, Absolutely. and I'm not used to the yellow light. And the really interesting thing is, um, the really kind of health things as well, is actually having this yellow light coming at your bedroom is not good. Mm. It's not good for your health. The natural state of your sleep is obviously peaceful in, in the darkness. And from the Forestry Commission's point of view, we're really interested in that because actually the natural state of the forest for animals and wildlife and it's everything that goes... It's darkness. Yeah. Roe deer go about in the pitch black, the badgers, the, you know, the owls, the otters, the, the bats. We've got thousands of bats, and I must warn you... The this top room's full of them. Sorry, it is. <laughs> We've already had a couple of... Droppies on our shoulders. Bad, bad, bad. We've been blessed by the fact. <laughs> but all that's, part, all that's really important to the ecosystem of uh, Kielder Water Forest Park. And, and that's of any forest in the UK, but because the forest is 65,000 hectares in size, sure. the important is you just magnify that by so many times. Yeah. And then Kielder Water in the middle of that. And as you say, the yeah. cast... Uh, yeah. It, it's amazing. Hey, I just trust me. When I first got out of the car here, you stand and you say, listen to that. And what was I listening to? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And it's a wonderful thing for anybody that lives in the bricks like I do to sense and feel the wonder of it. So I'm going to say thank you so much for letting us come down. And let's hope an awful lot of people make the trek and, uh, and come and see you. There's one thing I must share with you which sure. might stun you. In the 1980s, you could have bought this building Alan, for one pound. Now, I've heard this. I'm, I'm, I am quite willing to match the offer Sorry. today. <laughs> it's not on eBay anymore. Ah. But in, in, in the 1980s, this was quite a, you know, she was a bit, let's be honest, rundown. she was a bit run down, dry rot, a lot of trouble, and the, the commission being a government department, you know, everything's about saving money. Mm. And the Forest Commission genuinely at one time would have sold this building to you for one pound. And I would have bought it. <laughs> so thank you very much for allowing us here. Thank you very much, Alan. Great pleasure having you here. It's the Night Owls, Alan Robson from Kielder Castle. It might be cold outside, but the Empower Snug's been raising awareness of how we can all try and stay a little warmer this winter. Empower's been treating the shoppers of the North East to a hot cuppa, a chance to relax in the snug, and some tips on keeping warm, just like they did with Christine. I couldn't be more thankful for Empower and Warm Zone stepping in to help me. I'm now warm and comfortable in my home once again. And now it's your turn to feel the warmth. Tell Empower about someone who's warmed up winter for others and you could win shopping vouchers for them and a snuggly spa break for you. Go to metroradio.co.uk now to enter. Something very special is happening at Dalton Park on the 6th of November. It's going to really light up your life. As well as switching on our stunning Christmas lights, we're bringing you an exciting neon-themed event from 5 till 8 p.m. with glow stick giveaways, neon face painters and family entertainment from circus performers. Plus a spectacular fireworks finale. Our great outlet shops will be open too, so you can start your Christmas shopping. That's Thursday the 6th of November, 5 till 8 at Dalton Park. Christmas never felt so good. For a limited time, 
The Peugeot 208 Active PureTech 1.0 with color touchscreen, air conditioning, DAB digital radio and Bluetooth is just £119 a month on passport personal lease. Don't let it pass you by. Be in the driving seat instead. Contact Richard Hardy, Sunderland, Durham and Ashington now. Initial rental £3,065. Final rental £5,119. 35 monthly payments payable. This is a finance lease and you will not own the car. Excess mileage restrictions and terms and conditions apply. If you've had blood in your pee, even if it happened just the once, and there was only a little bit, and it was probably something you ate, and the light in the bathroom was funny, and you weren't really looking, tell your doctor. Chances are it's nothing serious, but it could be an early sign of kidney or bladder cancer. Finding it early makes it more treatable, so if you do notice blood in your pee, even if it's just the once, don't make excuses. Tell your doctor straight away. Be clear on cancer. 2014, what a year for music. But what's been the best part? You tell us. Yes, the 4Music Video Honours are back. Go to 4music.com slash vote and pick your best boy, girl, breakthrough, R&B and dance and video. But hurry, voting closes November 10th. Comparison. You do it on mortgages, broadband deals, even kitchen sinks. So why not your phone? At Carphone Warehouse, we have the widest range of networks on the high street. You can compare more pay monthly deals to find the right one for you, and you can upgrade to the latest smartphone, even if you didn't buy yours from us before. So call into your nearest Carphone Warehouse in Newcastle. Carphone Warehouse. We compare, you save. Minimum age 18, subject to credit status. What do you get if you cross Rudimental? Music legend Niall Rogers and 70 young people selected through O2's work experience program Go Think Big. The remix of one of the world's greatest songs, La Freak. Download the track now and discover more brilliant opportunities at gothinkbig.co.uk. Robson's Night Owls from Kilda Castle, deep in the heart of Northumberland, Metro. Hi, it's Alan Robson, the Night Owls, of course, from a dark place, as always. Now, Suzanne Gill is going to be reading our victims when they arrive. They don't know anything about that. She's also going to have her look around this very haunted place. However, our victims are very nearly there, so let's go across to the car, see whether they're excited or wetting themselves. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So you went in, <coughs> and as they were coming round collecting the money for the tickets, you went to the toilet, and then snuck back in again. So she looked round the crowd and she went, have you paid? And you went, well, if you're that effing good, you tell me. <laughs> so she says, well, now you haven't, because I've seen you got in the toilet. <laughs> and uh, she, said, she says, uh, I'm looking for William the Second, and he's gone. William the Second? Well, his name's Billy, he's, but he's a bit thick, you know. So yeah. he, at first he didn't. He went, "Oh, my father's William." She went, "Are you called William?" Yeah. Well, you're William the Second, then, aren't you? And he went, "All right." <laughs> she says, "You've got something wrong with one of your family." He went, "There's something wrong with all of them." <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't get a word in because he's very nice. Wow. <laughs> but All's he right. said it was great because like, she did come up with some stuff that was true, you know. Yeah. I've always wanted to go to like something like that or like a gypsy or something. Well, of all the ones I've heard, she's about the best one. She is, yeah. Could I mean, I wouldn't get to see anybody from this night, yeah. Oh my god. Oh, I'll be so freaked out. <laughs> Some of the stuff I've heard I do is amazing on the radio. Well, I mean, I didn't believe you could do readings over the phone well, or on the yeah. air, so when she came in, I was a bit skeptical, but for the but whole night, she had think, people in tears and everything. Do you not think that's a more oh true god. way? So we had to do it because she can't read your body language. Well, that's true, but I just thought, well, how can you get a, a feel of someone feel over the phone? I've, not, I've not had any pe like, people in my family die, though. I've, I've well, that's the thing I haven't, but apparently my granddad, who died when I was quite young, yeah. is, is looking over me all the no, time. No, st so. I've still got my granddad's and everything. I've, one of my yeah, best friends have someone, died. But maybe of, theirs yeah, or one even of, your friend, maybe. Yeah, one of my best friends have died. <laughs> but that's the thing, it could be a great grandma oh, or a great granddad. But there's always like one or two people with everyone, apparently. Well, I tell you, me, me nan, she had um, viral meningitis. Yeah. And she was in a coma and got rushed in a hospital. And it got to the point where 
that said if she doesn't recover by Friday it's an option to turn the machine off. Mm -hmm. So we're all discussing it and it said she'll be a vegetable and all that. You, need, you mm -hmm. see it, what's it called? When you decide for someone. Euthanasia. Yeah, is, is that, is that illegal? Of. Yeah, if you, no. You can, <laughs> you can volunteer to switch a machine off but you can't give them something to kill them. But mm -hmm. you can withdraw the medication so they will die. You know, like if, you, if your heart's been pumped up like by machine, mm -hmm. or your breathing's being done by machine, mm -hmm. you can withdraw the machine so your body will just shut down. But that, so is, that is no, still no, like that's, just... that's legal, but if you inject them with something to kill them, it's not. No, but that is still decided. Yeah, it is, but if they've said to you, they're not going to come out of this coma, they're going to be in this state forever, what do you yeah. do? Anyway, what we did, we'd all sat around and decided that might be the best thing to do because she was going to be in such a bad way. Yeah. So on the Friday, we're all, we were all going to be switching this machine off and my granddad had been out and bought a suit for the funeral. And she woke up on the Thursday, the day before we we're going to switch this machine off, oh saying, my God. I've heard everything you said, you said. <laughs> That's what I mean, like, yeah. you can't just, I don't agree with it, because, like, if, well, if, thing, you if, you, if you do, like, take it upon yourself to, like, yeah, we'll switch off the machines. Like you, you never know if they no, wake up. Like I just, it's a, there is always that off chance yeah. that could. Yeah. So I just got couldn't a, do it's it. It's a personal thing, you know. You've got to think about it a lot. Yeah. But on the back of that, about a week later, I went into the hospital to visit her, and she was still having to go at it. And she said, uh, "Your dad's not very happy with you either because he heard you saying you were going to switch the machine off." I said, "Hey, it wasn't just me." And I says, "My dad's not very happy." When he came in to see us yesterday. I says, my dad died in 1965. She was, I know, and he was sat on the end of my bed last night. <gasps> we were talking about it. Oh, I was like, bloody hell. Oh my God. I thought, God, I hope he hasn't been watching us all the time. She's not just freaked out by that. Everybody who works in this castle's now gone home. I have one key. The key to a fright night like no other for our victims. And yet, what else happened in a place like this? It's a castle. Jeepers. I'm getting a bit uh, jumpy now. The Scottish threat against Northumberland was coming to a head in 1382, so much so that the Earl of Northumberland was ordered to stay on his estate to deal with any incursion. Well, in 1388, Henry Percy, was senior, was taken prisoner, and 1,500 of his men were killed in the Battle of Otterburn. This was immortalised in this, the Ballad of Chevy Chase. Most Scots carried him off and began the ransom process. The rich rarely died in battle, they were merely bought and sold. However, between the two sides, over 27,000 men had died, not counting thousands of innocents in their towns and villages. And now, a group of Scots decided to stay in Northumberland. I mean, they'd just won a huge battle. If they continued their assaults on the rather more wealthy, well, then they could trundle back up to Scotland as rich men. So every reasonable sized farm or mansion house was attacked by around 400 heavily armed Scots. The women were always respected and never harmed. The crimes like rape, that was an English thing. The men, however, murdered or tortured to reveal every ounce of gold, jewellery or money they might have. They were hated, for they were not fighting for their nation anymore. They were just Scottish bandits killing for money. Well, the Border Reaver families were made aware of what was going on, and despite them fighting each other for 500 years, they decided one single truce. A truce that would only last three months, and then they could go back to hating each other again. And this would be the only time in history that the Border Reavers would stop being at war with one another. Three months, by which time these thieves had to be dead. The Charltons, the Milburns, the Armstrongs, the Robsons, the Thompsons, and all the rest met up at a tiny place believed to be Burness, and they swore an oath to one another. Now there was about 180 of the most skilled killing machines that the North had ever seen. They knew that they would be outnumbered three to one didn't faze them. They were excited. They couldn't wait to start. Some were bowmen, others threw spears with alarming accuracy. Others simply knew how to kill, so they disappeared into the tree line, leaving the manor house glowing. The Scots were coming this way. It was only a matter of waiting, and within two days the Scots raced across the open ground towards this beautiful mansion house. Whoosh! 
a hail of arrows flattened a dozen so, or so of them. A second wave holding up their shields tried again, and whoosh, sixty, seventy arrows hitting arms, necks, heads, legs, anything that the shield couldn't cover. Then all the Scots ran at the manor, believing that some would die, but the majority would get the, to the safety of the manor house. Those surviving reached the door, but couldn't open it. All of the doors and windows had been barricaded, closed, the windows nailed shut. Now the arrows were hitting them from all sides. So the Scottish leader, a man called Donnelly, ordered his men to race into the woods and kill everyone. Now, they tried to do that, but they were down to about a hundred, and they were tripping over their own dead, and once in the darkness of the woods, their eyes not yet accustomed. These people were easily stabbed, subdued, or hacked to death. After less than an hour, Donnelly stood there, alongside about fifteen of his men, and surrendered. This clan chieftain told the Reavers that he was a wealthy chief, and he would buy his own freedom. But he, these reavers could do with his men whatever they wanted. Fifteen Scotsmen bound and hanged from trees that still stand here to this day. Trees with grand stories to tell. Donnelly couldn't believe how few men had defeated all of his and began making remarks. And finally, as they marched him, bound behind a horse, a woman raced towards him, spat in his face and thrust a knife into it. And as the man collapsed, she was on top of him, bringing the blade down over and over again until not even the man's mother would have recognised him. It seems at another village, Donnelly had murdered her three sons, all aged under ten, and had also killed her husband. And it was believed at that time that you killed the children of your enemy so they couldn't grow up to be your next enemy. Donnelly's ghost is said to have been seen or felt in various areas of Keela. Some have approached a bent-over man, yet when he looks up, his face is missing. There's a few interesting entities in this place, and I do hope they all come out to say hi tonight. There's a door just opening, and I'm nowhere near it. And there you go. It's just closed again. Unbelievable. Right, we're at Gila Castle. It's going to be a busy, busy night. Meat lovers of Blythe. Premier Meats has arrived and there's opening offers all this week. Open opposite Asda in Blythe. As Hitachi Rail Europe embarks on exciting projects within train manufacturing, unique career opportunities are emerging at their state-of-the-art facility in Newton Aycliffe. Right now, we're looking for a standard engineer to work in the design office, implementing the company, international and industry standards required for successful train and system design. Don't miss your chance to apply. For details, text the word RAIL to 87474. Standard network rates apply. Hitachi Rail Europe. Made great in Britain. Ah, oh, here's the bill now. Thanks. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, energy bills. Thing is, I should be more in control of what I pay. At least in here, I can decide what tip I want to give. At Scottish Power, we agree. That's why our direct debit manager could help you spread your balance and choose how much you pay each month based on the energy you use. Find out more at scottishpower.co.uk forward slash your energy. Terms and conditions apply. Hang on, shouldn't this be on you anyway? Scottish Power, for the real world. Adventure awaits on the first Transpennine Express. So let's jump on a train and try somewhere new. Feast your eyes on the countryside. Lose yourself in the city. Let's liberate bums from sofas and kick cars to the curb with faster journeys, more seats and big savings on advance tickets at tpexpress.co.uk. It's time to love the train. Explore for less. First Transpennine Express. If your car needed new brake pads, you'd get them changed. If the smoke alarm batteries run out, you'd put new ones in. If the front door lock broke, you'd change it. So why haven't you got your flu jab? If you have a health condition, even one that's well managed or you're pregnant, the flu can have serious complications for you, like pneumonia. Ask your GP or pharmacist now. Don't put off getting the flu jab. 
When it comes to dating, it's all about first times. The first time you meet. Hi. Hi. The first date to the cinema. The first gig together. The first time you... Well, you know. <laughs> so, find someone you can share those firsts with. Join flirtify.co.uk, where you can chat, share, and get to know someone new. Meet singles in your local area and start living those firsts today. Flirtify.co.uk. Let's get together. That Change for Life is all about small changes to help make us and our families healthier. Like, a lot of food contains more sugar than you might think, and eating too much can make us put on weight, which may lead to heart disease, type 2 diabetes and even cancer. Making sugar swaps is a great way to stay healthy, and it's so simple. Instead of sweets, swap them for fruit. And for fizzy drinks, try no added sugar or sugar-free ones. Just check the label. It's easy to be food smart. For more help with sugar swaps, search Change for Life online. Why wait till Christmas for Santa to visit your home when you could fly to his? Metro Radio and Hayes Travel want to send your family away on an unforgettable trip to Lapland where you'll be riding with the reindeer, playing with the elves and searching for Santa. All you have to do to try and win is tweet. Keep listening for details on how to play the hashtag Hayes Holiday Sleigh with Hayes Travel, making you smile this Christmas. A night at Kilda Castle. Metro Radio. Alan Robson here. The Night Owls, of course. You, together with us tonight, from an amazing, amazing castle. Can't believe this place. It's getting more intense all the time. We're still waiting for our, our guests to arrive. So I'm having a look around, and as you go up the staircase, there's just a sense... There's a sense of dread in the air. There's, there's a, a like an electronic lift thing to help people up the stairs if they, if they've got uh, problems. At the top of the stairs, there's a. I could have sworn that wheelchair just moved. There's a wheelchair right in front of me, and oh, it's moving! It's moving! I'm not kidding! I'm not anywhere near it yet. It's moving! It's moving! The wheels are turning. Oh, look at that! Did you hear it? It's moving! <sighs> it's blocked my way. This, this is... This, oh. <sighs> it just curled from one wall to the other. I've got it now. This is me pushing it. But it was standing up against the wall, kind of there. And it just turned directly in front of me. Look, I'll get a photograph of it. Ah, unbelievable. Wheelchair just... Now you could see, is that the camber of the of the floor? D d doesn't take a lot to, to turn it round. Could that be the camber of the floor? But why did it, why did it just start moving when, when I... It's moving again. You stay where you are. And through there is the owl room. How, how appropriate. This is the room where, where people say that they feel things all the time. And it's very, very, very spooky indeed. And uh, as you walk through, <laughs> there's all kinds of things that, that just catch your eye. And there's a, a real owl sitting uh, at the top corner. We'll try and get a picture of him too. Now, I'm already getting a bit creeped out. They've got a, a, an exhibit of a, a tree where owls have worn a hole in the tree and they're nesting. And they've allowed a spider to build its web over the top of where the, the owl would keep its nest. And the fact that the spider's actually on that nest right now, that's a bit spooky. However... Can't wait for our guests to arrive now. Alan Robson, Kielder Castle, what a night this is going to be. I must admit, I can't wait for our victims to arrive. And in the meantime, I've sent Suzanne Gill, used by the police in the hunts for dead bodies, a psychic medium that has really impressed us. We've sent her for a walk around the castle to see what she gets. 
This is Suzanne Gill reporting from the Kielder Castle. My first reaction is straight away they have, the feature is not changed. The archway is still there. The courtyards. It just feels like you can, you're just claustrophobic amongst all of the atmosphere and the history that's seeping through. First initial thought is, ooh, what am I doing here? I feel threatened. Seriously, I really do. And I'm at the top, I'm at the third floor. Oh, okay. Mm. Right. Where was I? Oh, yeah. I'm coming up, the, I'm coming up to these, the, like, attic. I'm in this attic. Now, close your eyes and visualize this. There's a room in front of me to the left. And there's like a fireplace, which is like a marble white fireplace. And as I'm walking in, it's like a, like a reef. There's a reef, like um, an, en an engraving in the fireplace, and it's like a reef. Now, when I'm walking in, I can smell tobacco. I can smell cigarettes. It's choking me in this room. It really is. Now, I just, oh. Oh, I get a devious, horrible, cunning Sneak in the grass, this man. Okay, who are you? He's communicating with me already, would you believe? Oh, he's, he's, he's giving me Eddie, Edward. Oh, I don't like him. I've, I'd, I just, he, he creeps me out. He really freaks me out. Um, he likes to stroke people's hair. Oh, he loves the women. Maybe that's why. I'm in this derelict room. That must have been his room at that time. And I can see the fireplace in front of me, this marble. I'm looking out to this horrible window. Well, it's not a horrible window, but to me, it feels horrible. And I can see all the way down to the grounds. I can see that you can see the trees. You can see the walkways. You can even see the stream. So it looks like he's had a good old bird's eye view of this, this gentleman. Well, I wouldn't call him a gentleman. I don't know why I said that. But I need to mention that um, he loved, oh, he loved all kinds of dramas. He loved to be part of chaos. He loved to really swear. He was the one who ruled the grounds. He was the one. But this is a different era, I need to mention to you. This is, you're not going back towards what I've just seen downstairs. You're not going back towards where the banquets are downstairs. This is a different, different thing altogether. I feel really literally threatened in this room. I'm picking up on a lot of men coming into this room now. I'm picking up on that he's got a metal bed. I'm, I'm visualising his era. I'm picking up on this metal bed. I'm picking up on that I've been suffocated. I'm being suffocated. They had had enough of this seedy, malicious, horrible, vindictive man. They suffocated him. Maybe he needed it. Well, a car arrived a couple of moments ago. Here we are at Kielder Castle. We are in the pitch dark, standing next to uh, one man and one woman. Their task tonight to go into a place where a lot of amateur groups have gone before and yet in many, many cases have come out before time because so much stuff's been happening to people here. First of all, we have Stephanie. Hello, Stephanie. Hello. Tell me everything about you. Where are you from? I'm from Annick. And what do you do? I uh, work at Pitch and Piano in Newcastle. <laughs> Okie doke. And this was spur of the moment, I gather. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> last, last option thing, but... <laughs> and there's a bit of Border Reaver about you. Yeah, um, I'm originally from. Most of my descendants are like Waltons in there. Oh, there you in, go. Uh, like from Otterburn, Annick, Wooler, etc. So. so what you're saying is your family are a bunch of thieves. That's what bunch, you're saying. Bunch of gypsies, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. <laughs> we got Tony with us. We always promised that Tony, the taxi driver, first chance we could get, we'd bring him down to a ghost hunt. Glad to be here. Oh, yeah, very glad. Been waiting a long time. <laughs> Absolutely. We never, you and I have never particularly talked about whether you believe or whether you don't believe. What, what do you, or do you, don't you? Yeah, or? yeah, I do believe. I think I've seen things, and tonight is something I want to do to confirm that what I've seen is real. What did you see? Um, I've seen several things over the years. The most vivid one, driving to concert one night, midnight, with my wife. Yeah. Uh, going around the bends where the old ink works is, past Runskill. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the road, there was a young boy and girl, and we actually hit them. 
which was devastating, you know? Yeah. Um, felt the thump, saw it, everything, jumped out the car, my wife's screaming like she normally does. Yeah. Normally at me, but this was at the kids. <laughs> um, looked at the front of the car, nobody there, under the car, in the hedgerow at the side, nothing. Mm. And my wife then got out, she's had a good search round. There was a mist there, there was a light there, that all disappeared. No mark on the car? Nothing. Oh. We jumped in the car, drove to the concert at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> no, I didn't, sorry, it was 30 miles an hour. All the way. <laughs> all the way. <laughs> and couldn't sleep for about two days, and you know, I avoided that road for about 18 months. I literally would not drive on it, I went the long way around. There's a few, we've got a few roads where people keep saying stuff. Mm -hmm. However, uh, now you're here, what does it feel like? Because you're now in a very haunted castle that is busy, We've shown you some photographs that we took literally probably 15, 20 minutes ago, and uh, there's stuff going on. Yeah, it's an exciting place to be. Um, I just hope I don't hear Steph screaming too much, it'll put me off. <laughs> <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> right. So, w what would you like most to get out of tonight then? Definitely just a real experience. Like, I, gen I genuinely want to feel like a ghost touch me. I want to know that's a real thing. Now, this woman's an idiot. <laughs> However,. No, I hope you get that too, because the whole point is something that you wouldn't get anywhere else. Yeah. Once in a lifetime, I went to a place that was busy and this, whatever, happened to you. I hope you get what you're looking for. First things first, we're going to get Suzanne Gill, because Suzanne's with us tonight. She's going to read you, and we're going to leave the pair of you alone here. Is that all right, Suzanne, if we yeah, can leave you here in the darkness? And meanwhile, that means victim number one is you. Do we have any... Do we want to put Kit in yet, or shall we just start slow? We'll start start slow. We'll OK. Easy. So we're going to take you to a room that uh, we've seen a fair bit of activity in. I'll walk you there now. Good luck with your reading. You two guys, uh, Richard and Antoine de Bourgui, in the courtyard, please. And I'll meet you back there. It's just because I want whatever happens between Suzanne and Stephanie to be private at this stage. It's a bit of rain kicking on. Yeah, a bit mist. It's starting to go dark now, though. This is the... So where, where, where do we start you from? We could do that. No, that's too scary. That's the bit... I lost three rooms before. They showed me that's three rooms. That's the scary. toilet there. No, <laughs> I'll show you scary. No, but through... They showed me all the way around the castle in 50 minutes and said, yeah. will you remember it? And I said, yes, of course. And then lost three rooms and it took us 45 minutes to find them again. But... Have you not got your castle sat now? We've got... <laughs> not at all. But the, the place you're going to... And the thing is, just stay where you are, Tony, as well. Once we put you in a place, um, we need you to stay where, you, where you're actually going to be. And I think we're upstairs. Yes. A lot of this castle is beautiful because it's been done out, you know, like as a, a centre for education and what have you. I bought the children here years ago when they were small and they loved it. Yeah. However, oh, oh yes, careful. no, and this is why you don't run about a bit. There's a few tiny little lights, as you can see above you, like... Uh, just above, you see where the archway and that window is? Yeah. The shadow has just gone straight across in front. Well, can I say that's where you're going? Oh, I'm off, you're, <laughs> you're going... Hang on. <laughs> this is where you're going. Careful, there's stuff about. Yes, uh, yeah, it's a bit like step to us yard, isn't it? Now you've got your microphone on. Get yourself in to there. We're going to leave you here for 5, 10, 15 minutes. Is that OK? Yeah, that's fine. I'm, Are you sure? Of, well, for now, yeah. <laughs> I'll be the one screaming at you. girl run down the passage in a minute. Don't run anywhere. No. That is the thing. Shout and let me come and get you. How long did it take me to get up there? Less than a minute. Yeah. I'll be here as fast as I can, so no worries. OK, good luck. Brave man. He's already seen a dark shadow just move straight across the wall. He's going to be busy tonight. Good luck to him. Alan Robson, out.